In ancient Greece, and I'm talking 250 BC here, they didn't have indoor plumbing. So when men wanted to get clean and unwind after a long, hard day, they went to the baths. Now there were large pools where multiple men could soak together and smaller tubs for individuals. This story takes place in the Greek city of Syracuse, which technically is on the island of Sicily, which today is part of Italy, but back then it was part of Greece. Anyway, in Syracuse, there lived a man named Archimedes. He was a mathematician and an inventor and a lot of other things. Generally, he was regarded as the smartest guy in town. And that was a blessing, but it was also a curse because yes, it meant he could solve really complicated problems, but it also meant people were always coming to him and asking him to solve really complicated problems. Archimedes, or Archie, as his friends called him, actually, never mind, I just made that up. He would often go to the baths to relax to try to solve those problems. Now, on one particular day, he had a real puzzler. The king, a guy named Hiro II, had ordered him to solve a mystery. So you see, the king had this new crown. It was this beautiful gold crown, but he was a little paranoid and thought maybe the goldsmith that made it was ripping him off. He suspected that the crown was actually made of silver and just covered with a thin layer of gold. So he told Archimedes to find out if the crown was made of solid gold. That is the puzzle Archimedes was mulling over as he took off his toga and dipped his toes in a lukewarm bath. Now, there are a few simple ways to answer the king's question that he'd already dismissed. He couldn't melt the crown down and examine the metal because the king wouldn't let him do that. He also wasn't allowed to scrape the surface to see what was beneath it because again, damaging the crown, that was just out of the question. Whatever he did had to be non-destructive. Now, Archimedes already knew that gold was almost twice as dense as silver. And since density is the relationship between mass and volume, he thought maybe he could get an answer to the king's question by calculating both those values for the crown. Now, he could put the crown on a scale to figure out the mass, that part's easy, but how do you figure out the volume of such an odd shaped object? And let me be clear here, this is not an academic assignment you do for class. When the king tells you you have to solve a mystery, you solve it. The penalty for failure is swift and it's severe. So with his head swirling in circles, Archimedes climbs into the tub for a soak. And then a funny thing happens. The attendants had filled the tub right to the brim. So as he lowered himself in, the tub overflowed. Water spilled out over the lip, onto the ground, and not just a little water, quite a bit of water. How much water did I just waste? Archimedes thought. And then it hits him. The amount of water he displaced is exactly equal to his body's volume. Doesn't matter what he weighs. All the water cares about is volume. So he could use a tub of water to measure the volume of the crown. He could lower it into a totally full container of water and then measure how much water flowed out to see exactly what the volume of the crown was. Once he knew both the mass and the volume, he could calculate the density of the crown and figure out if it was made of pure gold or not. He'd done it. He'd found a way to solve the king's dilemma. Archimedes was so excited, he jumped out of the tub sprinted from the baths down the street all the way to his house. But uh, in his haste, he forgot to grab his toga back off the hook on the wall. So the citizens of Syracuse were treated to the sight of a middle-aged mathematician, buck naked, dripping with water, running down the middle of the road yelling, I found it, I found it. And since he was yelling that in Greek, what he actually said was, Eureka. I'm Dan Riskin, and this is Inside the Breakthrough, How Science Comes to Life, where we look at discoveries from the past to better understand our future. We live today in an age of science. That's from 1954. The elaborate paraphernalia of the scientist is nothing more than a tool for thinking. That was true then, and it's true today. Thinking like a scientist is way more important than having a fancy laboratory. What is this scientific method? That question was asked in the 1950s, but its roots go back thousands of years, and we're still asking it today. When it comes to science, it's the method that matters. So we're gonna do our part to try to understand that. 
Now I care about all this because I'm a scientist. Mostly I work on bats, but also a bunch of other stuff too. Pterosaurs, mice, shrews. But on top of that, I'm a science journalist. I spent years with the Discovery Channel interviewing scientists, researchers, innovators, explorers, trying to understand how they work and how they think. And all that has led me here. This podcast is produced by Simar, a research group working toward their own breakthrough in the way we prevent, detect, manage, and treat type 2 diabetes. Instead of focusing on the pancreas, the researchers at Simar are focused on the liver. In simple terms, they're solving an old problem using a new perspective, just like Archimedes. The story of Saimar and its founder, Dr. Wayne Lott, is a contemporary one. It's still being written, actually, but it's also an ancient one. It's a story as old as the very idea of science. So what we're going to do here is tell that new story using a bunch of old stories. Along the way, we're going to hang out with characters like Archimedes, Galileo, Newton, Einstein, Curie, Fleming, and the duo of Banting and Best. This is Episode 1, Eureka. Dr. Lott's Eureka moment came in 1989, but let's not jump the gun. Let's start with a discovery that happened 60 years before that. Medical science today owes much to one of the great scientific achievements of recent times. Listen carefully, because the most important moment of this story doesn't come at the beginning or at the end. It's buried somewhere in the middle. The discovery of a wonder drug now saving thousands of lives. You'll know when we get there, though, I promise, because it's the moment where someone yells, Eureka, or at least something really close to Eureka. You'll see. We'll start with the First World War. That lasted for four and a half years. 20 million people died. Half of those were civilians and half were soldiers. Now, some of those soldiers died on the battlefield, but an alarming number of them died in hospitals. Survival rates at military hospitals were horrific, mostly because of infections. Taking a bullet to the shoulder or getting a deep cut in your leg from climbing over a string of barbed wire those shouldn't be fatal injuries. But in the early part of the 20th century, that's exactly what they were. Any open wound was an entry point for bacteria, which would cause infection, which all too often proved lethal. One young man that had a front row seat to this tragedy was Scottish doctor Alexander Fleming. As a member of the Royal Army Medical Corps, he served in battlefield hospitals on the Western Front. Dr. Fleming is the Eureka guy in the story, but not yet. Young Alexander was the child of a humble farming family. When he was just seven, his father died. That made their daily life difficult, but thanks to his hard work and keen mind, he received scholarships to attend college and eventually medical school. He was incredibly smart, but not particularly tidy or hygienic. And that sloppiness actually led to what he later described as the greatest discovery of my career, if you'll pardon my terrible Scottish accent. He was doing research at St. Mary's Hospital in London, England, studying bacteria. On one particular day, Alexander showed up for work with a runny nose. Now, he wasn't the kind of guy that would take a day off work just because of a little cold. <coughs> Let me just say here, if you're sick, please, please, please do not go to the office. No one wants to listen to you sniff and snort and cough. No one wants to spend tomorrow feeling as crappy as you do today. Stay home. Don't be a Fleming. Anyway, on this particular day, let's make an exception. So, a bit of snot drips from Fleming's nostril into a Petri dish. He knew right away that sample was contaminated, so he pushed it to the side of his desk and continued working on the rest of his samples. And that's where it sat for the rest of the day and the rest of the week, and half of the next week. In all that time, numerous colonies of bacteria grew out of the sample in the dish, but there were two spots in the dish, exactly where his nose mucus had fallen, that were still completely clear. Fleming had discovered a new enzyme. It was found in nasal mucus, but also in tears and saliva 
on skin, in hair, on fingernails. It was part of the body's natural bacteria killing system, and he named it Lysozyme. It was an amazing discovery, but it's not the Eureka moment he's remembered for. You see, Lysozyme had its limits. It was kind of weak. It worked really slowly, and it was most effective against the least harmful types of bacteria. But still, it grabbed the attention of the medical community and boosted his profile. Now, when I say boosted his profile, I'm really overstating it. I mean, this guy's a researcher studying bacteria in a lab. It's not exactly on the front page in a newspaper every day. But still, he had a good life. He got married, he had two kids. And in the summer of 1928, a decade after the end of World War I, he awoke on a particularly hot and muggy August day in the city of London and decided to take his family out of the city for a couple of weeks. They headed north to his native Scotland and enjoyed a relaxing holiday by the seaside. When he returned to work, the first week of September, the samples he'd been working on before he left were still sitting out on his workbench. Now, he'd been studying Staphylococcus aureus. This is a bacteria that's very common. In most cases, it causes minor skin irritations, like zits, or respiratory stuff, like a sinus infection. In extreme cases, it can cause staph infections that can be fatal. Even today, 50,000 people die every year in the United States from staph infections. But despite that potential for danger, Dr. Fleming had just left this stuff sitting out on his desk for two weeks while he was playing at the beach with his family. But what Fleming found when he returned was that in one of the dishes, some mold had grown. It must have been some kind of contaminant in there, maybe a breadcrumb or something, because this is exactly the same green fuzzy mold you find on old bread. So around the edges where the mold touched the bacteria culture, there was this clear liquid. And he looked at that under a microscope, and he was blown away. I say, gentlemen, this is something interesting. Take a look at this dish. The mold appeared to be breaking down the walls of the cells in the bacteria. So it's not just inhibiting growth. It's actively attacking the Staphylococcus bacteria. I'd say uh, something in that mold is destroying the stops in that dish. This was his eureka moment. It looks good. Very good. It was a beautiful combination of years of study with a singular moment of serendipity. Fleming was so ecstatic about the discovery, he, well, he took another couple weeks vacation. Seriously, he was just stopping at the lab because he'd been given a promotion and I guess there was some paperwork to do. But once that was done, he took off for another couple weeks. Historians like to point to these singular moments, these supposed turning points in history that, in hindsight, are earth-shattering, but often in the moment, they're just another day in the lab. In this case, as with so many other discoveries, there'd been a decade of work leading up to that eureka moment, and before it would make any impact, there was another decade of work yet to come. <laughs> is notoriously slow to grow. I know you're thinking it appears pretty quickly on your bagels, but seriously, to get a usable quantity of this stuff and then separate out the active chemicals, that takes forever. After a year of growing mold and testing it on various bacteria, Fleming named the active chemical penicillin, and he published a paper about the world's first bacteria killer. It was called an antibiotic. The discovery was greeted with a yawn. I mean, in theory, people thought it was interesting, but in practice, I mean, you needed so much mold to harvest the active compounds, you'd never be able to do anything real with it. So let's put some dates in context here. Fleming has his Eureka moment, 1928. His paper naming penicillin, 1929. But for the next 10 years, this is just a laboratory curiosity. I mean, it was used by some chemists to separate out different kinds of bacteria, but using it as medicine? People aren't even thinking about that. In fact, once when a doctor asked him if penicillin could ever be used on patients, Fleming's answer was, I don't know. It's too unstable. It'd have to be purified, and I can't do that, Captain. I, I just assume he sounded exactly like Scotty, but I don't know that either. 
other people eventually got involved. And in 1941, 13 years post-Eureka, they put penicillin to the test. A police officer by the name of Albert Alexander was in the hospital. He'd scratched his face on a rose bush. The scratch crossed his cheek from the corner of his mouth to just under his left eye. And that scratch got infected. The infection spread, and his face was covered in sores, and one of his eyes had to be removed. It appeared to all involved that Constable Alexander was going to die. Researchers had been testing small doses of penicillin on mice, and the results were promising, but this was a human, and the dose he was going to need was much larger. They considered Albert's dire condition and decided this was the opportunity for a bold experiment. They gave him an intravenous infusion of 160 milligrams of penicillin, and they waited. Within 24 hours, his temperature had dropped, and the infection had begun to heal. He was even able to eat a meal. So they gave him another dose of penicillin, but they didn't have a lot more on hand. So they started collecting the patient's own urine and extracting unprocessed penicillin from the pee and giving that to him again. But even doing that, by the fifth day, they had no more left. The patient, who had shown such a promising recovery, started to deteriorate. The infection returned. A few weeks later, he died. They had shown that penicillin could slow an infection, but the manufacture and storage of penicillin was the insurmountable challenge. So you remember how the story started in the First World War? Well, guess what? It's the 1940s and now the world is at war again. On December 7th, 1941, Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and declared war afterwards. In March of 1942, American doctors, for the first time ever, used penicillin to successfully treat a patient with septicemia. Now that's blood poisoning. And that single test used up half the penicillin in the whole country. The military realized they needed to find a way to produce this stuff at industrial levels. And that is exactly what they did. Within two years, in preparation for the D-Day landings of June 1944, they had generated 2.3 million doses. That supply of antibiotics saved thousands of lives. But it didn't happen until 15 years after Dr. Alexander Fleming came home from his holidays and said, it looks good. It looks very, very good. I mean, I wish he'd said Eureka, but, you know, you can't change history. So what's the takeaway from all this? What part of the long rambling story are you supposed to remember a week from now? Well, most people latch on to the moment of discovery, that benign accident. The fact that he left something on his desk for two weeks unattended. People love telling that story. I mean, you've probably also heard that the microwave oven was invented when a technician stood too close to a vacuum tube and a chocolate bar melted in his pocket. Or, or that Viagra was tested on men as a treatment for heart condition and then a bunch of patients wouldn't give the drugs back when they had leftover pills and researchers discovered that perhaps it was also influencing blood flow relating to other parts of the body. We love those explanations for a couple of reasons. One, they're easy to remember. But two, they make us feel like, hey, I could have done that. But when we think that way, we're kind of kidding ourselves. The truth is, Eureka moments are in the middle of a long stretch of hard work. Fleming spent years studying bacteria and viruses. That gave him the perspective to see what was really happening in that Petri dish. Most of us would have simply been grossed out by the mold and have tossed it into the sink to be washed out. Those great eureka moments aren't just this artifact of history that don't happen anymore. Don't believe anyone who says there's nothing left to figure out. Obviously there is, and eureka moments still happen every day. That's my segue from the past to the present. Did you like it? I thought it was pretty clever. See, that's what this show is all about. We're going to use these historical stories to understand what Saimar is doing right now, and we're going to check in with them every episode. Now, when I first heard about Saimar, like any critical thinker, I did my best to come in with an open mind, but I was skeptical. 
I mean, diabetes has been around for thousands of years. There's an ancient Egyptian papyrus from the third dynasty that describes an illness with exactly the same symptoms. So they're probably talking about diabetes even back then. The ancient Greeks were the ones that gave diabetes its name. And 100 years ago, humans basically figured it out. Frederick Banting and Charles Best proved you can treat it with insulin, which is a hormone that comes from the pancreas. Case closed, right? So now, this research group from Manitoba, Canada says, the key to diagnosing and reversing the disease lies with another hormone called Hiss that comes from the liver. And they say that same hormone can help treat heart disease. This brings up a lot of questions, but don't worry, we've got plenty of episodes to get through them all. Today, I'm going to start with their founder, Dr. Wayne Lott, and his Eureka moment. And I've, I've actually had a number of them in my career. And each time before the Eureka moment, there was always a serendipity moment. Today, Dr. Lott is the principal investigator behind Symar. But in the 1980s, he was at the University of Manitoba as the head of the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics. My serendipity moment was in 1989, the Soviet Union dissolved and the Canadian government came up with the idea to offer Ukrainian scientists the opportunity to come to Canada for a three-month period. So, a communist country on the other side of the world implodes, then the government introduces an intellectual exchange program, and suddenly, Dr. Lott finds himself collaborating with a researcher from Ukraine. I asked him what he was interested in. He said, well, he, he wants to study the effect of insulin on the brain. So they did an experiment to test that and found well, nothing. We found that insulin in the blood wasn't really having any direct impact on the brain. So that was a real puzzler. We were totally flummoxed, uh, not, not really able to explain it. Now, Dr. Lott is not a brain guy. His expertise revolves around the nerves connected to the liver. So he started tinkering with those, but still working in the context of the insulin in the brain experiment. So... We cut the nerves and uh, repeated it. What we found was that cutting the nerves to the liver wasn't affecting the liver at all. It was affecting the hind limbs. That was a eureka moment because that meant that there was a hormone that was being released from the liver that was being controlled by these parasympathetic nerves that was affecting the peripheral tissues, primarily muscle. At that moment then, I told the whole lab, guys, we're shifting gears. We're going to take a look at this. The tearing down of the Berlin Wall was not supposed to lead to a breakthrough in diabetes research, but it did, because research is a road without a map. You can't get to a eureka moment by plodding resolutely ahead. Something had to be ready at the right time, in the right place, for whatever reason, that led you to think about something that you had never considered before. Uh, and certainly after your Eureka moment, then heavy plotting comes. Just like Archimedes and Fleming, Lot's Eureka moment was really just a simple observation. Water flowing out of a tub, mold in a Petri dish, reduced glucose uptake by the hind limbs of a lab animal. Okay, maybe not quite as obvious. But because those observations were sandwiched between decades of study and many years of hard work, those moments of Eureka changed the way we understand the world. The two primary conditions that have to be present for a eureka moment to have an impact? The existing knowledge of the scientist and a ton of work after the fact to put it in motion. But there is another factor that turns an observation into a discovery, and that is timing. Too soon or too late, and a eureka moment is just, well, it's a petri dish you have to wash. The next episode of Inside the Breakthrough is called Bad Timing. We'll share a couple of stories from history and also take the next step on the journey with Dr. Lott. By the end of season one, we'll find out if the Symar team has made a discovery that will change the course of human health. I'm Dan Riskin. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen. New episodes come out every two weeks. Oh, one last thing before we go. That gold crown that the king asked Archimedes to check out? It was less dense than pure gold. So some other metal had been mixed in. And when the king found out he'd been cheated, well, no one ever heard from that goldsmith again.
You could say he got Archimedes screwed. That's just, that is a nerdy joke. That's all that is. Listen to more of Inside the Breakthrough with Dan Riskin, now streaming on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts.